In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Today's gospel is, in a way, the most Anglican of gospels. Why? Because it is a both-and gospel, and we are both-and people. What I mean is that Anglicans are born out of being both Catholic and Protestant. You knew that, though, right? We are the people of the via media, the middle way, the way that sees how we can be both one thing and at the same time seemingly the exact opposite. We are a people of contradictions, of tension. It's an uncomfortable position to be in. It's difficult to explain or even understand. But then again, today is the feast of Christ the King, the feast day where the one who is both human and divine, both priest and sacrifice, the one who is both our brother and friend, and yet also our Lord and King. So Jesus is both and, and so are we. The only problem is, we are both sheep and goats. And this passage, aside from pointing it out, is also a both-and passage in that it is one of both comfort and warning. Like I said, both-and can be an uncomfortable and confusing place. So let's examine it just a little bit more, more closely. Now, this is a parable, and it's one of those stories that Jesus tells about the end of times, or as he puts it in today's gospel, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. If you've ever heard the word eschatology, that's what it means. The end of the age, the day of judgment. So this is an eschatological or eschatological story. And everyone in Jesus' audience understands what it's about. They understand this day of judgment. They understand that someday the Holy One will come and will judge the people. And everyone will get just what they deserve. There'll be the sheep over there. They'll get into heaven. And the goats over there. They'll get into hell. You heard this in Ezekiel. You know this is imagery that they understand. And the idea of the good folks getting what they deserve and the bad folks getting what they deserve, that's an old idea, one that the people who are listening to this get. So when Jesus tells the story, they're comfortable with it. And when the gospel writer Matthew writes it, they know it too. And I mention that because this is a passage that only happens in Matthew. Not in any of the other Gospels. So we ask ourselves, why did Matthew include the story? Perhaps it's because he was writing to a specific audience, a church that was under severe persecution at the time. And some have argued that it might seem comforting to them to believe that while they, the good people, the sheep, will go to heaven... Those who are persecuting them are goats who will get what's coming to them. That has been suggested. And it is tempting. Except that there are two new features in this story that you didn't hear in Ezekiel. They are both and features. And they make me wonder about that interpretation. The first new feature is that Jesus has all the nations gathered, very specific language, all the nations. It's not just the believers. It's not just the chosen people. And it appears in the way it's told that many of those people over there who are not the chosen people, who are not the believers, that many of them are sheep as well as goats. 
in this story, Jesus doesn't distinguish the nations. He doesn't distinguish between you know, the Gentiles and the Jews, between the believers and the non-believers. They're all one. And he takes each person individually. In telling this parable, Jesus makes clear that all people are God's children and that there are sheep and goats among all of us, not just the Jews and not just the Christians. So one terrifying way of looking at it is nobody's safe just because of who they are. The second feature is that neither the sheep nor the goats are aware of how their behavior was either good or bad. The sheep have no clue how they've earned this honor, and the goats have no clue how they've earned hell. The goats even suggest in the parable that they are good people. It's like they're saying, if we'd just known we were doing anything bad, we would have changed. If we had known it was you, we would have served you clearly. Sure, persecuting Christians is goatish behavior, but what else is? According to the parable, a lot. It would seem from Jesus' words that simply failing or refusing to see Christ in the other, in anyone else, is pretty goat-like behavior. And if that's the case, we are all doomed. Because none of us manages to see Christ in everyone else all the time. Not one of us. Because for every hungry person we have fed, there are many more we've ignored. For every stranger we have welcomed, there are many more we have passed by or even driven away. For every sick person we visited, there are many others we've allowed to languish in loneliness. And dare I ask how many of us have ever visited an inmate in prison? Yes, some of us do some of these things some of the time. Maybe we even do some of these things all of the time. Or maybe we do all of them on occasion. But there is not a person alive who doesn't fill the role of both sheep and goat, at least some of the time. We are all those goats. Like I said, both and is an uncomfortable place to be. In fact, it's impossible, though, to be the sheep all the time. None of us can do it. And that would be a very terrible thing for us if it weren't for the fact that Christ is both judge and the merciful one. The comfort in this passage, then, is knowing that while it's impossible to live up to Christ's standards, we are still welcomed into the kingdom of God. There's the comfort. And now the warning. Because this is still a passage of warning. Because it lays out the expectation that Jesus has for us who claim to follow him. It's an expectation that has nothing to do with the fact that we've been granted a place in the kingdom of God. Rather, the expectation is that our treatment of others is entirely independent of our knowledge that we've been given a pass. We are to treat others as Christ, not because it earns us a place in heaven, but because we see Christ in that person. And if we choose to stop seeing Christ in the immigrant, in the inmate, in the poor person, 
in the naked person, in the sick person, in the dying person, then our hearts are in danger of becoming really very goat-like. So yes, this is a parable of both comfort and warning. Very Anglican, isn't it? But what it's saying is that it is the eye of the heart that matters. Do we see Christ in each other? Not just those who are like us, but every other person. Believer, unbeliever, American, foreigner, male, female, you pick. Do we see Christ in them? And do we treat them like it? How do you respond to a parable like that? Maybe with both and behavior. Maybe we both go and spread the good news that God is love and make it believable by living it out ourselves. Independent of reward or punishment, both unaware that we're doing it and yet fully aware that this is who Christ is calling us to be. Amen.